Welcome, everyone. It's a wrap with Rap. I am your host, Ron Rappaport. Before we start, I would like to thank all our listeners, sponsors, and supporters that have helped to make this podcast so successful. The podcast is being heard in all 50 states, all provinces of Canada, and over 45 countries around the world. The podcast has just been ranked by Feedspot as one of the top 35 overcoming adversity podcasts from thousands of podcasts on the web and is ranked by traffic, social media followers, domain authority, and freshness. This podcast features people who have overcome life's challenges and adversities, people who can inspire, motivate, and educate us in an assortment of topics. My guest today is Randy Grimes. Randy is a Baylor University graduate and an award-winning 10-year veteran of the National Football League who crawled on his hands and knees into treatment for an opioid addiction that developed while treating career-related injuries. Randy redefines what it means to be an addict and tackles challenging topics such as substance abuse disorders, pain management, mental health, suicide prevention, trauma, addiction in the workplace, and access to treatment, and more. Randy has made it his life's mission to change the way we think about these life and death issues. Welcome, Randy, to the podcast. So excited to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I, I appreciate it. Thanks for the platform. Uh, you're more than welcome. Let's let's start at the beginning, Randy. Tell us about young Randy growing up in East Texas uh, through your college years. Yeah, man, I had a great childhood. You know, there was no trauma. There was nothing in my life. I had the greatest parents in the world. Never saw them touch a drop of of alcohol or, or anything. Brother, sister, the old that were older than me, same way. You know, uh, just great role models for me. You know, football. Football was, I, w I won't say it was religion, but it was a close second, you know? Yeah. Uh, growing up in East Texas, right outside of Dal uh, Dallas, uh, Tyler was the name of my hometown, the rose capital of, uh, of the world. Yes. Yeah. And, we, uh, we have friends in Tyler, Texas, by the way. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. it was, you know, football, Friday night lights, pickup trucks, girls, you know, that was my whole life back then. And the one thing that came easy for me was football. Man, right. uh, you know, everything kind of centered around football. And, you know, my parents loved it. My dad probably missed his calling. He was a uh, adult probation officer and he should have been a football coach because that was that was, uh, you know, he was he was my best coach growing up. And wow. um, so, you know, I had a brother that went off to southern Arkansas, had a great career there. And uh, of course, I went off to Baylor and and uh yeah, looking back, I wouldn't change a thing, Ron. You know, everything worked out just like it was supposed to. I had an opportunity to go anywhere in the Southwest Conference that I want. You know, now it's the Big 12, but back then it was the Southwest Conference. And, uh, you know, I could have gone anywhere I wanted to, but I chose Baylor. It was the best decision I ever made. So how far is Baylor from your house? Uh, you know, Waco, Waco, it's only about two hours. And uh, okay. it was an easy drive. Not that I ever went home, but I wanted to stay in Waco. I met my wife the very first day, our freshman year. And uh, we went out that night and we got married after our junior year. So, you know, there, that, that was the reason to stay in Waco. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So you get drafted in the NFL second round in 1983. You're selected uh, 45th overall. You played in 118 games. Uh, for 10 years from uh, 1983 to 1992. Uh, give us some background, how you got started uh, taking prescription medications back then and what, and what types uh, when you played uh, pro ball, was it, was it opioids or benzodiazepines? What was the story on that? Yeah, well, it was everything. And, you know, I can remember getting to the uh, locker room. I, I remember being drafted by the Bucks and having a locker right next to Leroy Selman when I got out here. And, uh, you know, that was a huge deal for me because that was, you know, the first real legend that I'd ever watched playing on TV and followed through college and through the pros. And to have a locker right next to him was, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I, I was I was in a whole nother world. Sure. And I remember, you know, having those conversations with Leroy before before I even started, you know, uh, the first season uh, back during training camp of my rookie year. And, you know, the first thing I learned from Leroy is that football was no longer a uh, game. Now it was a job. And the second thing I learned from Leroy was you do whatever you have to to stay out on that field. Because if you're not out there in your position, somebody else was going to be and they were going to take your job from you. So. 
you know, I, I'm sure Leroy didn't mean to take handfuls of pain pills every day to, to practice and play through the, the nagging injuries that you get playing professional football uh, or, the, or the handfuls of sleeping pills that you take at night to get to sleep through the throbbing pain that you're having. Um, but that's what I was willing to do to be the best that I could be to put, to, uh, get that next big contract to be all pro to feed my family. And, you know, you also, Ron, you don't want to get the reputation of always being on the injury report or always being listed on the injury report or always being worked on back in the training room by the doctors or the trainers because are missing practice because that was the reputation you were never going to get away from and what was sure to be a short NFL career. So, uh, you know, I, I looked at it more like a necessary evil to, to feed my family and be the best I could be instead of what it really was and what it really developed into, which was a full blown addiction. So the game was a lot less stringent on the rules as far as hitting and head-to-head -head contact, et cetera, than, than what we have today. Can you tell us the types of injuries you sustained during those 10 years and you were playing center uh, and how did it affect your, your performance, you know, when you were out there playing? Well, I mean, and, and it was that old warrior mentality where a lot of the injuries I had, I didn't even report, you know, I just treated them myself the best I could. I taped them up a little tighter than usual, and I would just get out there and I would I would practice or play through whatever I was going through. But, you know, you're talking about ankles. You're talking about elbows. You know, you're talking about neck. Uh, you're talking about back injuries. You know, of course, knee injuries are always a problem. And um, these are the kind of things that you've got to play through or somebody else is going to be in your, in your position. And I was not willing to let that happen. So – you know, my solution was to throw down the pills every day, tape it up a little tighter, rub some dirt on it and get back in the huddle. You know, that old mentality where big boys don't cry and uh, and you just uh, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off and you get back in there and you shut up. You know, that was the mentality that that I had. That, that's kind of the way we were raised, you know, by our yeah. dads, because that's the way they were raised by their dads, you know. Right. Right. So like when you say uh, you were taking the pills and stuff, uh, were they prescribed or how did it work back then? As far as. Yeah. And, that's, you know, that's, I, that, that's another that's another way that I justified what I was calling a necessary evil was. I mean, I was getting them from the team doctor, so it must be OK. Or I was getting it from the team trainers. So it must be okay. Or I, I had teammates who, who had them in their locker and I'd get them from them. So, you know, I just looked at it like that, that, that must be the culture of the NFL. You know, Ron, we had a, we had a, uh, a, a, a drug safe in the middle of our training room and, and, you know, it looked like a regular safe in somebody's house, you know, and, uh, right. you know, it was never locked and it was full of narcotics. So, you know, if you didn't get it from the doctor or the trainers, you could just go get it yourself. And uh, if it ever was accidentally lost, locked, we had uh, we had three white guys that started on defense the whole <laughs> 10 years that I was there and their jersey numbers were the combination to that safe. But it but it never was really locked and I could just go get whatever I wanted out of there or anybody could just go get whatever they wanted out of there. You know, you said you you uh, you played through that all that pain and stuff. Uh, they always talk about the adrenaline kicking in. It, it, does the adrenaline kick in and kind of you black that out of your out of your mind? Yeah, it does. It kind of masks everything. I mean, once you, once a ball gets snapped and that game gets going or that practice gets going or whatever you're going through, yeah, of course it does. But eventually, you know, that pain's going to come back and uh, it's going to be there. It's going to remind you that you have an injury and that you probably shouldn't be out here on the field with it, but. You know, like I said, you, you, you just can't say anything. And that, you know, that's that was the mentality back then. You know, coaches, well, owners put pressure on doctors to get players back out on the field probably quicker than they should. Uh, coaches put pressure on the medical staff to get a player ready probably before they should. But, but the player himself puts more pressure on the medical staff than anybody to get back out there as quick as they could because – they don't want to lose their job. 
So the 1990 season ends, uh, the 1992 season ends, and you are let go. What was that experience like for you? When Man, you, that was that was that, that was ten I, years. You you were there ten years, right? Yeah, that was the worst part of it, you know. And and you know, the ten years that I was there, I played for five different head coaches. You know, I played for six different offensive line coaches, which was my position coach. You know, I probably had ten different quarterbacks underneath me, and and four different general managers up in the front office. But the one consistent thing about the Bucks in the '80s and early '90s was Randy Grimes at center. I seemed to survive every one of those changes. Yeah, ten years. But I remember time. that last year, and 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 back then, you know, after your last game, if you weren't going to the playoffs, then you would come in the day after the game, and you'd clean out your locker, you'd watch the film from the day before. You'd have an exit meeting with your coach, and and then you would be pretty much gone until minicamp started again the next spring. You know, now it's more of a year-round job. But back then, we would we would actually break and move back to Houston and have a life uh, outside of football. And uh, I can remember that last year, you know, standing at my locker after that last game, and I, you know, I felt a hand on my shoulder. I heard the words, "Randy, we won't be needing you anymore in Tampa." And as I turned to look, all I could see was Coach Sam Weish walking by me and 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 saying those words and and then exiting out the, the locker room. And I can remember thinking, wow, that's how it ends. You know, yeah. all the blood, sweat, and tears that I've left on football fields all over this country since fourth grade. And and that's how it ends. A coach putting his hand on my shoulder that doesn't even slow down long enough to look me in the eye like a man and tell me that my, my, my career is over. And I had gotten hurt that year. So I knew I couldn't go try out with anybody else. And I just remember raking everything into a black trash bag and walking out the back door and Randy Grimes, the football player didn't exist anymore. And, you know, I already had this rage and addiction going. And now you throw the fact in that I don't have a uniform to wear anymore, that I don't have a playbook to look at, that I'm not Randy Grimes, the football player. Throw that on top of, of that rage and addiction, that, and that was just throwing gasoline on a, on a dumpster fire. Yeah, I can imagine. So now you're away from the game. What was like life like after that? And what kind of jobs did you have? And uh, the addiction uh, to the prescription drugs, obviously – continued uh so what was life like uh you know with the family and everything well yeah and and you know I, the the injuries just kept getting worse and the chronic pain just kept getting worse my tolerance to the medication just kept getting higher so i needed more and more pills all the time and uh it was it was uh, a, a never-ending cycle of uh of chaos you know and and listen i had some great jobs and great homes and cars and all that and lost them all because I couldn't stop doing the pills and the sleeping pills and all the stuff that came along with that. And, you know, it was just, uh, it was just chaos 24 seven. And, you know, the new normal in my life was going to going to emergency rooms and ambulance rides and hospital stays and detoxes and lost jobs and repossessed cars. And I just couldn't stop the, 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 the insanity, you know, and, uh that was for the next 20 plus years how did how did the how, how did that work with the family i mean did they know you were having this problem uh all along or was it kind of being hidden from them for a while and obviously then it it got exposed you know i mean they could probably tell right. something was wrong well i mean there were there was years that were better than others there were months that were better than others and and um, but when it all came crashing down, it, it really came crashing down. And, and my families were the victims of all that. You know, yeah. uh, the perfect storm was coming together in the spring and summer of 2009. And uh, that was a, what happened was a very good friend of mine that I played next to out here at Tampa, Tom McHale, passed away. And he was doing Ron. He was doing the exact same thing I was doing. That was self-medicating his injuries. He got while he played with the box. And one morning he just didn't wake up. And that really got my attention. And uh, the fact that my daughter wouldn't let me come around my first grandchild because I wouldn't fit to be around her new baby, that got my attention. You know, the fact that my wife was was willing to walk out or, or leave me because she couldn't sit by and watch me continue to kill myself anymore, you know, that that hit me. And then also I was having a series of health uh, concerns as far as seizures and stuff that went along with uh, detoxing off of uh off the uh 
the, the, the meds that I was on. So, I mean, that, that, that all, it took all four of those things to find and, and losing another house and losing another job and losing another car and ha going through all my finances and all that. I mean, all that together was coming together in spring and summer of 2009. And that's when I finally put up my hand and asked for help. So that was your rock bottom moment. That was that's rock bottom. Yeah. And, and, and so then you, you, you seek help. Uh, so when you seek help, how, how, how did that work? Uh, did somebody make well, a call for you or? Well, and, and, and my wife was willing to make one more phone call for me and whoever, and back then they didn't have anything out, out there for former NFL players. You gotta, you gotta think, you know, I had already burned through all my finances. I didn't have any insurance. I didn't have any way to go to treatment. Uh, but whoever she called that day up in New York at the league office on Park Avenue, uh, whoever she talked to that day knew somebody who knew somebody. And that's how I got uh, to treatment out in Florida. And that was September 22nd, 2009. So can you describe to us uh, the treatment process and your transformation uh, of the healing process? What impactful things uh, did you learn in rehab? Well, I mean, first thing I had to do was detox and uh, they, uh, nobody really wanted to take me. A lot of these treatment centers didn't want to take me because I was such a liability. I'd had so many seizures and I was such a health risk, you know, that, that nobody really wanted to take a chance on me except for this one place down in, uh, in West Palm. And uh, so we took it really slow. And listen, when I came in, I also came in with a plan. I was going to have my knee replaced while I was in, uh, in treatment. I was going to have the other knee surgically repaired, and I was going to have some neck surgery. So I, while I was in treatment and while I was – and right after I went through that detox phase of, of treatment, I went off and had these surgeries. And then I came back to treatment, and then I detoxed off the hospital meds that they gave me. And then I stayed for a nut that was that took 30 days to do all that. And then I stayed for another 60 days and worked on the underlying issues that made Randy Grimes do what he did. And, you know, what I discovered about myself was, you know, I, I worked on that lack of identity, you know, that identity I lost when I when I didn't have that uniform anymore, when I wasn't Randy Grimes the football player, you know, and, and Ron, it was like, I, I had to grieve the death of that person, you know, and it, and it really was a grieving process. And it was something that I had to go through therapeutically with a professional, you know, and really do that process and really discover who I was now and what my contribution was, you know, when, when I didn't have that uniform, when I wasn't Randy Grimes, a football player anymore. And, and the self-esteem that comes with that and the, uh, the, the identity and, and, the, and uh, getting over the depression and all that stuff that goes along with that. That was the kind of stuff that I worked on that 60 days uh, after that detox process. But, you know, it, it was during all that that I realized that I wanted to make what it, everything that I'd been through and everything that I'd put my family through, I wanted to make it mean something. Right. And, um, you know, that's when I that was kind of the birth of the nonprofit that I have now and what I do now, even though I didn't know then what it was going to be. I just knew that I wanted to make it mean something. And, you know, every everything that I put everybody through with my family and friends, and finances and reputation and all that, I wanted to uh, I wanted to make it mean something and give back to those people. And and um you know, that that was kind of the birth of pro athletes in recovery right there. And you wanted to make that that journey mean something. You wanted to also help people. Yeah. And I knew there was a lot of guys out there that I had played with and against that were going through the same thing that I was going through. Yeah. You know, that warrior mentality. I, I wasn't the only one that had it. In the sure. NFL. I mean, there was a lot of guys out there that was suffering in silence. And, and usually, you know, kind of like me, whether it was pride, ego, guilt or shame wouldn't put up their hand and ask for help. But usually it was because they didn't think there was anybody else out there like them or that there was any resources available. So, you know, I got with the NFL. We, we, we formed a division of the NFL called the Player Care Foundation. We started going out and sharing my story. Uh, and you know what, guys? Guys started coming out of the woodwork and hands were coming up all over the country. And, 
you know, I was able to help hundreds and hundreds of, of, of former NFL players, but I never dreamed that it would bleed over into other sports, you know, over into Major League Baseball and NHL and NBA and pretty much every sport you can think of that has an organization that supports their former players. So I understand. Uh, well, you just told us how pro athletes in recovery originated. Uh, well, tell us a little bit about pro athletes in recovery. Uh, what does the organization do exactly? The organization, it, all it does is it serves between, as a bridge between resources and players out there that are struggling. And, and not only players, but anybody, you know, it's, it, it, you know, sometimes I box myself in by, by saying that I, or, or talking about just athletes all the time when really it's pro athletes that are helping anybody that's struggling with an addiction or mental health issues. And we're a bridge uh, between that person and resources or, or uh, appropriate resources, I should say, because everybody's different. Everybody has different issues. Everybody needs a different kind of place. And uh, so that's what we do. And then we also help people as they get out of, out of treatment, with what I what I often call the, the 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 forgotten piece of the whole puzzle, and that's aftercare, you know, because people get out of treatment and that door hits them in the rear end, and that's when they get scared. That's when they're left to their own devices, and yeah. you know, that's when I want to keep them accountable, put them in a safe environment, get them get them in front of the appropriate resources for aftercare, and that's that's what we do. Yeah. And, and that seems to be a, a big issue with all kinds of in, in the medical uh, complex. I mean, you can you can even take it, you know, cancer patients. I mean, yeah, they, they cure you or so-called cure you and then they shove you out the door and that's it. You know, it's right. saying now, right. You're on your own, you know, you're so, on your own. And that, and that's just, yeah. So it's, it's great what you're doing. Now, I understand you and Lydia, your wife, you stage interventions for pro athletes, celebrities, business leaders, and everyday people. Tell us how that process works. Oh, you know, that, that and that's the beautiful piece of all this. I mean, who would have ever thought, you know, that we'd be doing interventions together? But we, yeah. we had the opportunity to do, well, we've had the opportunity to do hundreds of, of interventions all over the country together. And, you know, it's, it, it, it just, it, it's been a great platform for, for, for our relationship to heal, you know, to go through that together and to work with families, you know, it's, it's a good cop, bad cop. She's the good cop. I'm the bad cop. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but it, it's been great for us. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, for her to go in and to work with a family and, and, and to share her experience and everything that she went through in my 20 plus years of addiction, you know, she just relates so well to the family. And of course, you know, I come in and I'm the, I'm the bad cop, get, get in the, get in the face of the person that's struggling kind of deal. And it, it just, it's worked out. We've been really successful and it's something that uh, we enjoy doing. We don't do it as much as we used to, but now we, uh, you know, especially since the book came out, but you know, it's, it's, it's just another phase that we went through as far as our healing as a family, as our, uh, as a marriage. And, um, you know, it, it, it's been a beautiful thing. How, how did that intervention hope that, that intervention business start in the first place? I mean, did somebody call you or is it something that you advertised that you were going to do or how, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, it started uh, with a treatment center that I was at originally. And uh, yeah, it started off as, as families that couldn't get a loved one to commit to treatment or couldn't get them to, to say the right thing or they didn't know what to say or how to go about it. And, you know, it started off as, as them calling in to our admissions and then my admissions calling me and uh, me talking to the family you know, finding out if they were willing to do an intervention, seeing if they were willing to do everything that I was going to ask them to do. And um, then I would get on a plane and, and uh, next thing you know, I'd be sitting in their living room in front of their loved one with them after after training them and preparing them for everything that was going to happen. Uh, and, and, and was very successful at it. And then Lydia got involved and then it just got even it got even more 
more uh, uh, what's the word you know I mean we we just really enjoyed doing it. yeah we just really enjoyed doing it together and we were really having a lot of good luck and success and um, so yeah most of those uh, came through admissions departments or or once word got out that we were willing to do it or that we were that we were available to do it then you know they would just stuff would come across uh, emails, you know, or Facebook messenger, you know, you, or a, a word of mouth call, you know? Yeah. They, uh, those people that were having the intervention, they must've respected what you two had to say because you two had been through it. I mean, you're the real deal. You know, you're not just some guy out of college reading it out of a textbook. So I would imagine you got a lot of respect from those people. Yeah, and, and and having her there with me, I mean, we we gave it to them from both sides, you know, from the family member who had suffered and from the one who had caused the suffering, you know, and we were right there in the same room with them on the same couch to share in our experience from both sides of it. Did you have any uh, follow up on that? Do you know how successful those interventions were? Well, I, I do follow up with and a lot of people still stay in touch with us. You know, they're very grateful. Uh -huh. uh, for what we did for them, the families are very grateful that we got involved and helped them out through this. And, um, you know, we've had some people that uh, obviously have fallen off. That's the nature of the beast, but they got right back up on their horse and, and kept on going. So uh, for the most part, we've been pretty successful as far as uh, uh, the clients that we, we've been able to serve have been pretty successful. Now, Randy, you have authored the book Off Center. Uh, I guess you were the center of the there you uh, go. of the bucks. So uh, I was a little you, off too. That's how you, yeah, that's how you get it. Uh, what prompted you to write it and tell us a little bit about the book? Well, and it was something that I'd been thinking about for a long time. I, I, I wanted a platform for my whole family to have a part in. You know, I wanted I wanted uh, everybody to to take part in this and and uh, and. and I wanted to use it as a healing tool for the Grimes family. You know, I didn't care whether it sold a copy or not. I just wanted it to serve the purpose of healing my family and everything that I'd put them through. And, and sure enough, it served that purpose. You know, my, my kids had a platform in it. My wife, uh, my, my mom, uh, brother, sister, everybody that was pretty much affected by my addiction had a platform in it. So I'm really proud of how it turned out. I never dreamed it would be as good as it is. I mean, it, it really turned out well. And a matter of fact, we wrote it uh, in a pretty unique way, whereas my story of my addiction is paralleling a, a, uh, a, 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 a fictitious intervention that me and Lydia are doing at the same time. So it's two stories going at the same time, but they go back and forth between each other. And, uh, you know, it just turned out really good, Ron. I'm just, I'm shocked that I, that I was able to put together such a good book yeah. uh, on my first try. Wow. How long did it take you to write the book? Uh, it was a three-year project. Wow. It really was. I mean, COVID, COVID helped a little bit because of the isolation and everything. It gave me more time to work on it, but, uh, it was, it was a three-year project and, uh, there, there won't be a, there won't be another, another one. Well, I heard that that's 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 a really tough job to write a book. There's, that's not an easy task at all. Yeah, it it, it was. Uh, you know, there were there was a lot of uh, a lot a lot of times where where I was stymied or somebody was stymied and we just couldn't get past that next level, and then all of a sudden it would just come to you and you would just go like crazy for a while, and then you'd hit a wall again. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, we, we pretty much went through it. Uh, the editing and everything that goes along with a book is what takes so long. Yeah. Now, in your opinion, Randy, in the professional sports world, uh, is the addiction problem getting better or worse as a trend? And why are uh, more athletes seeking uh, help more, more than before? Is, is the stigma getting less over the years or what's happening with that? Well, I think fortunately, there, and you've probably seen this the last few years, but you see more people, more celebrities, more athletes that are recovering out loud. You know, it's it's a little easier now to raise your hand and say, listen, you know, I, I, I need some help. And uh, when the, the more people that we get to recover out loud, 
um, then it, the easier it is for guys to put up their, or, or girls to put up their hand and ask for help. Uh, you know, I, I think that over the last, well, I could say 14 years, because that's how long that I've been doing this. I think that because of the advocacy that we've been doing uh, with the NFL, uh, that, that the NFL now is more accountable and uh, how they prescribe narcotics. There's no more off-label prescribing like there used to be back when I was there, meaning that they would just pour it out of the bottle that it came from the pharmacy in, you know, and, and uh, they pour it in your hand like that. You know, there's no more of that going on. But there is still narcotics in the NFL. There's still opioids. There's still benzodiazepines. You know, there's still that stuff going on to some degree. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of working with players that have recently retired and they've confirmed that for me. So, you know, we, we've made great strides in, 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 in the way that they prescribe narcotics in the NFL, but we're still not there yet. And, and, you know, Ron, as long as that warrior mentality that I talked about goes on, you know, then, then guys are going to continue to do what they have to, to stay out on that field. Yeah. Yeah, you know the game. The game had the game's changed a lot, but that mentality is never going to change. Randy, what do you miss about not playing? Those game checks. Yeah, <laughs> I miss those game checks most of all. But no, you know what, Ron, I miss the most is uh, you know it's not being out on that field and being between the bleachers or under the lights. You know, I miss being in the locker room. You know, I miss. Uh, I miss that camaraderie with, with all the guys. And, and, you know, that's the beautiful thing that recovery has given me back is giving me back a new locker room, you know, an opportunity to be with like-minded people that have been to those dark places that, that I've been to, you know, because of the addiction. So, you know, I'm grateful to recovery for that, but you know, that's what I miss the most is that camaraderie and being around my buddies. So let me pick your brain a little bit. What is your opinion about the current game is it is it too violent is it okay as it is or do changes uh need to be made to make it safer if that's possible given the nature of the game i mean uh we're talking right now we're in uh, january 2023 we're in the playoff season and lately uh we've had a couple of pretty big scares with guys getting really really hurt out on that field uh so what's your opinion about all that? Well, the game's never going to change. It's going to always be violent. It's going to always be controlled chaos, you know, out there. You know, you're never going to stop. If, if you ever stop the game from being what it is, then nobody would ever watch it, you know. And I think they've done the, the most they can do. They've softened the game to the point to where they're flowing, they're throwing penalty flags, you know, 10 times more than they ever have before. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know what else they can do to the game. There's nothing that they can do to the equipment. And the uh, only thing they can do is make rule changes. And the more rule changes they make, the more they soften the game and make it something that's unwatchable, you know. So I think they have to be careful. They're walking a fine line now because they've taken it to the point to where it's almost to that, you know. You can't even touch a quarterback anymore. Whereas back when I played, you know, they, you could do anything to a quarterback as long as you got <laughs> to him in time, you know. Yeah. And so it, it, football is football. And you know what you're getting into when you sign up to it and, or sign on to it. And, you know, it, even me, knowing what I know and everything that I've been through, you know, I, there, there's nothing that I would change. I, I, I would go back and do it all over again. Obviously, I would like to do things a little, some things a little different. But yeah. I would certainly go back and do it all over again. I mean, I love the game just that much, and so does everybody that plays it. Randy, what cultural changes of the game today, in your opinion, is different from, from when you played back then? Mm, like what? Like, uh... Well, just, you know, the nature of the game. Uh, like you said, is it is it getting softer? Uh... Uh, yeah, <sighs> It definitely is getting softer. I think there's a different there's a different kind of athlete that are playing it today than back when I was when I went through in the 80s and 90s. You know, I think guys are coming in a little more um, 
more entitled. Yeah. If that's the right word to say, you know, they're, they're treated in high school and in college uh, with a, with a sense of entitlement. And of course, when they get to the pros and they get those big, I mean, the money that they're making now is just ungodly. So, you know, there's also that sense of entitlement that goes, goes with that. Uh, and with that comes a, a different kind of attitude towards the game. And uh, even though it's a great product I'm seeing out on the field, I'm seeing some great games all the time. The, the, the NFL is the NFL and it's uh, and the greatest, greatest game on turf, you know, and uh, it's going to always be that. Um, it, it's definitely a different game. I see a lot of things that the NFL feels like they have to take care of, whereas we as a locker room would have policed our own back when we played. You know, it would yeah. have never got to that next level where the NFL had to, where Pete Rozelle had to take care of it or, or something like that because we would have taken care of it as a team. Uh, but now I see things that are, that are and, and a lot of that has to do with social media and everything else that's going on, you know, or, uh, or a, a video camera on everybody's phone. And it's just a different game socially um, yeah. than, than it used to be. Yeah. Randy, how can people contact you? Uh, there may be people, there are obviously going to be people listening to this who know somebody or, or, or need help or whatever. How, how can they contact you? Yeah, you're right. And everybody I talk to knows somebody who's struggling with this, whether it's substance abuse or mental health issues. Usually it's both. Uh, but you can find me, man. I'm on all the social media channels, you know, of course, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Sober Center 60. Uh, hey, you can also go to my website, which is proathletesinrecovery.org. Okay. Uh, you can find my book uh, either on Amazon, just look up Randy Grimes, or you can go to offcenterthebook.com. And uh, Ron, if you can't find me, you're not looking very hard because I'm pretty much everywhere. <laughs> I and, also and have I'm available to help anybody. I also have randygrimespeaks.com. Uh, is that too? There you go. Another one. Okay. Uh -huh. We're gonna put we're gonna put those links in the podcast notes. Okay, so to those out there perhaps seeking recovery and recovery or for their concerned loved ones, what Randy, what words of advice from your vast experience with the subject do you have for them? That it's okay to not be okay, but you've got to put your hand up and ask for help. You know, so many families don't know who to call, what to say, um, and. and you, but you've got to make that first phone call, you know, and I want to be that first phone call. I want to help families or someone who's struggling with this navigate through the the whole ordeal of getting the help that they need and finding the most appropriate facility for them. Uh, but the main message, Ron, is, is that people know that it's OK to not be OK, but you got to put your hand up and ask for help. Absolutely. Randy, I want to thank you for joining us today and, and sharing your story and Thank you for all you do uh, for others uh, needing help from the addiction problem. I wish you nothing but good health and success in your work going forward. Uh, comments and suggestions for the podcast, uh, you can email me at itsarapwithrap at gmail.com. Our website is itsarapwithrap.com. We have a Facebook page and group, It's a Rap with Rap. Instagram, we're, uh, it's It's a Rap with Rap podcast. And we're, all the episodes are on YouTube, uh, It's a Rap with Wrap the Podcast Uncut. I want to thank everyone for listening. I want everybody to please stay safe out there. And for now, it's a wrap.